So our first change maker of the evening is uh, Fatima Afsal, a PhD student in the Department of uh, Civil Engineering, co-supervised by Professor Dominic Frigant um, and Professor Stan Kubo from the School of Human Nutrition. And tonight Fatima is going to tell us about how our choices of what we eat for breakfast can change the fate of superbugs. Fatima. The entire world has just faced COVID-19, whose fatality rates were over 2 million deaths per year. It was a surprise pandemic, and no, we were not prepared for it. But the next health crisis is not going to be a surprise. In fact, it is going to be due to antimicrobial resistance, and predictions already say that its fatality rates could be as much as 50 million deaths per year from 2050. 2050 is not that far. In fact, all of us are planning to be here in 2050. And some of you might even be here in this room, probably attending the 30th edition of Set Talks. People in research and academia are taking efforts to curb the threats brought by antimicrobial resistance. And we all might have a role to play here as well. The threat due to antimicrobial resistance has been increasing because of the increase in the number of hotspots which kinds of act as a storehouse for these pathogens. Two years back, Claire was on this stage and through her you learned about wastewater treatment plants being a hotspot for wastewater for antimicrobial resistance genes. She's my colleague, we work in the same lab in fact. Before her, we already knew about the possibility of hospitals and animal farms being the hotspot for antimicrobial resistance. And through her, we learned about a third hotspot, the wastewater treatment plants. And today, I'm here on the same stage to introduce you all to a fourth hotspot for antimicrobial resistance. Think about it. Where could it be? If it's not animal farms and hospitals and wastewater treatment plants, where else could it be? How does it look like? Well, well, let's come back. The answer is right here in this room. Surprised? It could be me. Or it could be you, you or you. It could be any of you sitting here right in this room acting as a hotspot for antimicrobial resistance. How did this happen? Let me show you. The treated wastewaters, still containing the microbes which are carrying the antimicrobial resistance genes, are being released into the waters we swim, used for irrigating the farms where we grow our foods, or may even leak into the groundwaters or surface waters which we depend for drinking. That sounds scarier now, doesn't it? But the story does not stop here. Now imagine a non-pathogen carrying an antimicrobial resistance gene entering our gut. In our gut, they are encountering our gut microbes, which play critical roles in keeping us healthy. Now these resistance genes can be considered as batons that we use in relay races. These non-pathogens can transfer the antimicrobial resistance gene batons to the gut microbe thereby creating a hotspot for these resistance genes in our gut. Now fast forward to another day when a pathogen enters the body. This pathogen does not carry a resistance gene yet. But our gut microbe now carrying the resistance gene baton can transfer these to the pathogen thereby creating a superbug right there. Let me say that again. Our gut microbe just turned a normal pathogen into an antimicrobial resistant superbug. We could pass on these, super, these resistance genes to our loved ones, or we can come to an event like this and pass it on to another person for whom it might become a problem. So what we have learned since Claire was on this stage two years back is that it's not just animal farms and hospitals and wastewater treatment plants. But all of us sitting here in this room right now may be acting as a fourth hotspot for antimicrobial resistance. That is the bad news. But the really good news is that since we know it is happening, we can do something about it. And that is what I'm going to share with you all tonight. First of all, to be able to study our gut microbiota, we need to have a system which will allow us to continuously monitor the gut microbiota and it should be versatile as well. 
because our entire gut is not a single reactor. It has got various compartments ranging from the stomach to the small intestine and the large intestine. Out of these, the large intestine has got higher number of microbes as high as about one kilogram. Hence, I would be focusing on large intestine for my studies. But the complexity does not stop here. The food that comes into the large intestine needs to be first processed by the enzymes that are released by the stomach and the small intestine. In addition, the large intestine has got three compartments, namely the ascending, transverse and the descending colon because of the slightly different pH values which are present in them. Hence, the system that we come up with need to be able to address all of these complexities and that is what I have done in my lab. Over the past year, I have built in the lab an artificial human digestive system whose model has been adapted from our collaborators who work in School of Human Nutrition here at McGill. And we have tried to give it a very creative name, the gut emulator, consisting of different compartments ranging from the stomach to the small intestine and the large intestine, three of the compartments as you can see here. Each of this compartment would be fed three times a day, similar to how we have breakfast, lunch and dinner. Moreover, in, all of, in the first two reactor compartments representing the stomach and the small intestine, we would be adding in enzymes and the last three compartments which represent the large intestine would be inoculated with human fecal samples to represent the gut microbiota that would be developing inside them. Such a system would allow us to study sustainably the gut microbiota and hence I will be utilizing the gut emulator reactor to study how these resistance gene batons are being transferred between each of the compartments. Another important factor of the gut model is that each of the reactor component has got a different pH value. Now how is the pH important? The pH of each compartment will ultimately determine the kind of microbial community which will develop in them. Hence it is important to be able to continuously monitor the pH of each of the compartment which is being done in a reactor with the Raspberry Relay Circuit System which will monitor the pH every 10 seconds and would add in acid or base accordingly to bring back the pH to its normal range as it was specified for each of the reactor. We have already carried out the trial run for our gut emulator reactor and the results for the pH that has been obtained for the ascending colon, which is the first compartment of the large intestine, has been represented here. And as you can see, the x-axis represents the number of days of operation of the reactor. The most important thing to note here is that over the course of the operation for most of the time, the pH value is staying within the range that was specified for the reactor, which is around 5.7 to 6.1 here. But you might also be noticing certain peaks and dips that are occurring here, which are majorly occurring when the food is coming to the reactor or leaving out of the reactor. Because remember, the food is coming from a reactor whose pH value is different. And also, it will create a change in volume within the reactor. So ultimately, the pH would be different. But the most important takeaway here is that our pH regulatory system has been effective in making sure that the pH is staying within the range that has been specified in the beginning. So now we know that the gut emulator works. Now what next? I would be utilizing the gut emulator to study the resistance gene baton transfer process, which can be divided into two steps. The first step involves a study of entry of resistance gene containing microbes from wastewater, followed by a study of what exactly happens within the gut following their entry. For the first part, I would be adding microbes which are derived from the wastewater into the gut emulator. And the samples that are obtained at several time points would be analyzed to see how the microbial community is evolving in each of the compartments and whether it is changing with respect to the invasion that is happening from the outside. We would also be utilizing a specialized multiplex PCR system which we have developed in our lab which would be able to tell us if the levels of the resistance genes are changing when the invasion is occurring. Now for the second part, I would be utilizing a group of specialized microbes which show fluorescence. Now, 
they are showing fluorescence because they carry a specific gene, the green fluorescence gene. So the green fluorescence protein encoding gene can be considered as the baton here. If this baton is being transferred to our gut microbiota, our gut microbes will begin to show fluorescence, which can be detected by using specialized microscopy systems. Thus, both these studies would be able to help us understand how these resistance genes enter our gut and what happens inside it, whether it is different between each compartments and with respect to time, how it changes. So now we have looked at the problem and the, uh, now we have looked at the problem. How about the solution? What if the solution could be in changing the gut microbiota composition? What if we can have a solution in which it can on one hand increase the number of beneficial microbes in the gut, but at the same time can bring down or inhibit the growth of the pathogens and superbugs? Can we achieve both at the same time? Is there such a solution? Looks like we know such a molecule. It is called anthocyanins belonging to the class of polyphenolic compounds which are abundantly present in plants. Research already shows that polyphenols, especially anthocyanin, has got the ability to improve the growth of beneficial microbes in our gut, but at the same time inhibit the growth of pathogens and superbug. It is also possible that they might be playing a role in the baton transfer process itself or affecting the levels of resistance genes following the invasion. We do not know yet, and that is what I'm trying to do using my gut emulator reactor. So I would be employing anthocyanins along with the feed that is given to the gut emulator reactor to test their effects during the invasion of the resistance genes into the gut and the baton transfer process that might be occurring in the gut following their entry. Now you may ask me, if anthocyanins are that important, Fatima, where can I find them? Well, you might already be having them in your breakfast oatmeals or muffins. Yes, we are looking at blueberries, which has got one of the highest content of anthocyanin, as high as 60 to 80 percent of its weight. Hence, I will be utilizing the anthocyanins which are derived from blueberries in my gut emulator reactor to test their effects in helping us reducing the impacts brought by the resistance gene invasion and the baton transfer process ultimately. So far as you have seen, most often the solutions to some of our biggest problems may be lying in smallest compounds such as blueberry anthocyanins. And we have also seen that Antimicrobial resistance is not someone else's problem to deal with because we all are acting as superbug generating machines right now. So a possible solution uh, to improve the health at an individual level for a sustainable and healthy future might be to add in that extra box of blueberries the next time that you go for grocery shopping. Thank you.